journey of S and C for its life. Um, so specifically about how we inspect, because it's the most important activity we do with S and C. Um, inspect, inspecting it in terms of safety, and there's also an element of reliability there as well. Um, so starting from manufacture to maintain, um, going through this, sort of the, the, some of the um, activities we currently do, and this is within UK, so this could be London Underground, it could be Network Rail, it could be um, any other part of the UK, so it's sort of common what we, what we currently un understand. A um, couple of pictures there, if well, any of you are wondering where is that? Uh, so on the left, this is a, a layout that was um, designed to be installed at Oakwood, uh, London Underground, and this is a, a composite sleeper, a composite bearer layout with modular tie plates. So that particular installation had to go underneath a very shallow deck bridge with very shallow footings, um, so they had to modularise it uh, and use that method sort of to install it. Um, on the right is Hoboken, so that's a um, going into Hoboken station on the, um, that's in New Jersey. So that's travelling into the terminus station there, you've got a, a, a set of, there's actually slips coming into this, you see the slips just through there, and the scissors just, just ahead of that, um, going into the terminus. So that's um, in New York, New Jersey, so very prone, prone to flooding, but later on we're going to some, some work I did in New York as well. A little bit about me, um, for those that don't know, 32 years, chartered in civils and PWI, um, now the VP for Southern, along with Anna Chelsea, so we have sort of the Wessex, Thames Valley corridor, um, so we've merged, we've got the, um, the Western Zone, Andy Franklin and so on, London Zone we have um, Jonathan Bray, uh, and we've also got parts of Ashford as well that we're trying to, that we're, that we're looking after. Um, my experience, major major projects and renewals and maintenance, um, reliability and SNC product development um, as well. I was a principal SNC engineer or PNC engineer for, for TFL for a while. Um, did some work in New York City for switching track reliability as well. Um, and then recently doing some track product development for Network Rail within Technical Authority um, and other sort of asset enhancement um, um, topics. So this is our current process for SNC inspection. And so it's just a, a, a broad overview of what we do from installation through from prefab installation and maintenance. So we do the SNC quality inspection. We inspect the SNC as it's laid in the yard. Um, so the supplier does that for us. And we also do it as the installer or as the, the customer. We would either witness or we do the same, same inspection, similar inspection. Um, design verifications are then done on site. Sometimes we may overlay the SCC on site to see that it does fit and everything ties in neatly. Um, and we also do a delapidation survey of the existing. So to see that the, the, the two tie in, there's no other issues with the, the existing tie in. Uh, we then go to the installation phase. Um, we then do a quality installation uh, form or an inspection of the SCC. Now, this is where a doctor, um, in some cases, people just tend to do the basic gauge and measurement <laughs> and aspects. But, we should really adopt the whole process that we do at the inspection stage on site as well, doing the same form, the same inspection, same level of, of, of um, detail that we inspect. And that generally took, forms part of the inspection test plan, the ITP. Um, at installation, other things we'd look at is this sort of quality, the TRV runs, quality thresholds, maybe other sort of asset data we look at, um, the as built surveys to make sure we within tolerance and, and design offsets or post, post tamping. Um, and then we sort of step into the maintenance phase where we look at the SSC inspection gauging. So we do a detailed inspection quarterly. That's where we measure things like flange ways, residual switch openings uh, and gauge and so on. We have our 053 and 1054 inspections for facing switches and, and crossings. Um, we also have the continued track recording vehicle geometry checks we do. We then may overlap that with rail defect register, certainly within crossings and switches to look at defects on the rail side. Um, and then we have the patrolman inspection, which is a basic visual inspection that the patrolman would do. So that will all link into what I call sort of separate work streams that it's very difficult to see those merged into one. There is no dashboard that shows all this. They're, they're independent inspections that, that need to be pulled together to so that if you can see any links between the two, if there's some causal factors from one causing the other, you know, it, it's overlaying. So you need to look at all those separate data streams. 
So let's just go into the first step, which is how we inspect um, our SNC. So we currently use um, a 3D Trimble or coordinated survey um, to actually uh, check the alignment of the SNC, and that would sort of form the, the baseline alignment. Um, there are still old methods with so this one bottom left here. You can't see it, but there is a string line down the left. So the old string line measurements off is still used in some yards. Some people rely on the Trimble or, or 3D measurement to, to coordinate it. Um, some inspectors use an amber trolley. So to say bending down and taking gauge readings, we use uh, an amber trolley or a, a, a trolley that measures the geometry, so gauge, um, and can measure some other things as well. But predominantly gauge, so it sort of saves time inspecting and measuring gauge every every bearer. And we use your steel tapes, your four foot gauges, your, your standard stuff that you that, that's always been used. You know, feeler gauges have started to come a bit more um, into use because we need to measure intricate one millimeter clearances between parts. Um, so and step gauges for sort of wider gaps. Uh, and then going into some of the new methods, some being adopted, some are in use, some are approved. Um, bottom right hand there is the Felix SSC inspection trolley. So now in use, not fully rolled out, but in use on network rail, approved for use for inspecting SSC. Um, it's an automatic trolley that would, that would um, remotely travel through the SNC and it measures gauge, flangeway, flangeways, alignment, uh, twist, and other geometry items, um, and takes around 10 minutes per turnout to, to, to measure that. Um, very looks like a fly really swashed on the um, screen there, but that's that's actually a drone. Um, so that 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 drone inspection um, that we trialled up at um, this is the Howarth VAE um, uh, SNC manufacturing facility, um, where we're looking at what can we get with a drone, what what level of detail, what granularity, how how accurate is measurement recording from a drone at, at certain different heights. Um, and other things are 3D trolley scanners. So there are scanners. Um, the Felix does have actually have a laser profile. It, it profiles the switches and the crossings, and you can match it to the design to see how far out in terms of where. But there are other 3D trolley scanners that can give you the whole 3D image and you know report out a 3D um, file of the, the whole the whole layout as well. Uh, so going on the drone side, um, as part of the Intertrack 2 work, so this is a European funded project back in 2021, where Network Rail um, looked at the level of accuracy we can get with drones. Um, so we were looking at can we use a drone to do a basic visual inspection. Uh, around at the time there was the, the death of the SNC inspector um, at Norberton or Surbiton, one of those. Where um, and you know as part of this work, you know, the use of drones was being explored to see can we replace you know boots boots off ballast drones in the air to do to do what uh, an inspector can do, and that's whether it's a sort of detailed supervisory inspection that's the, the gauging and accurate measurements or the basic visual looking for cracks for damage for loose bolts and so on. Um, so and some of the other additional benefits we wanted to look at as well was. Can we use it for a prefabrication inspection? Can we do take all those measurements we take on that form <coughs> for a, a prefabrication inspection? Um, and can we generate a 3D model, a digital twin of the layout that we can then use in BIM or we can use to to as as the sort of digital twin going forward that we can monitor pro monitor degradation against and where and, and so on. So so that was sort of the main aspects or the, ma the main um, sort of outputs we were looking for. So we used a company called Plowman Craven. Um, the Vogel R3D uh, drone was used for this. Um, we had to get full civil aviation um, permission to, to fly. So that's done as part of the, the network, rail, network rail um, drone team has that set up so they can um, um, access and can arrange for planning with CAA for the drone flights. Um, so that's all done via work, standard work package plan. Um, and the boots off ballast, you know, we, we, in certain areas really was to try and look at um, certain areas within the rail corridor that we can uh, deploy drones to be used, whether it's SNC, plane line or other inspections, vegetation and so on. So it's all part of that sort of wider drone usage. Um, the reduction and elimination of possessions, because so we can fly, train, fly drones over live running tracks as well. 
um, and the extended range of um, added value of the sort of products, the photographic imagery, 3D point clouds for the data to go into, orthogrammic, uh, so photogrammic um, uh, surveys as well that we can then analyse and measure off of afterwards. So, so that was the main idea to go to, to go to drones. So we did some comparisons. This was a, a, a site at Colville. Um, so it's a, a branch line for um, for freight, and um, we looked at the various different inspection types: basic visual, the patrolman, a detailed inspection um, using the TEF forms that we use, the track engineering forms, um, a layout prefabrication, what we do when we measure SSC in the layout, and just as a sort of cursory, we wanted to see for 053, 054, which is you know your your switch and stop rail relationship and your your crossing profiles. Could we measure the profile of those warm switches or warm crossings? So we looked at that as well. Um, so you know, we developed this test plan, worked out where we're going to do it. Some of them were at the Colville yard, some of them were in other sidings, and some of them was at the VAE Har Harworth yard as well to do to do that work. Um, so we developed the test plan from that. Um, some of the um, Evidence and some of the um, uh, sort of reports and what we found was, was on this form. This is, this is a standard TEF form that we do for SNC inspection, measuring gauge and flange ways and so on. So we, we wanted to duplicate what the supervisor, the SNC, the, the supervisory inspection would do and see how accurate we can get the drone. So we did the measurements um, to the left hand side with manual methods, then we did it and compared it with the, the drone methods as well. So in some cases we found a two to three mil tolerance or, or bandwidth and or sort of, uh, um, variation. So we looked at, at why we were getting that variation. Most of it was around areas like the nose or in the switch, which we, which we know are difficult areas to gauge. Um, bearing in mind that what the drone has to do, it has to find that data point 14 millimetres down from the rail head where we measure gauge to. So you have to teach the drone to measure that and you have to put an algorithm in because you've got all of this data within that data set. So an algorithm then basically smooths out that, that those dimensions um, and that's how we can do that sort of comparison. What we had to do is so we started off with actually providing a survey control because the drone needs a survey control to go to. It's like having, a, you know, TBNs and station points and, 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 and um, ground survey control so that the drone can measure to whether they're targets and then we know the coordinates of those targets. We can then relate that to G GPS or the, uh, any coordinate grid system. Um, we had uh, the Vogel and a Falcon 8 drone, so we had two drones we were trialling to capture the data. Um, of varying quality and varying um, uh, also the amount of images they could take and the, and the, um, uh, the height at which they can fly as well. So we adjusted the height from 40 metres, 20 metres and we did one at five and, and two metres to see if the accuracy um, varied from that. Um, so then we could look at the um, sort of decision on the sort of quality of the data um, to undertake a BVI uh, or the supervisory inspection. Um, and then we have a thing called a, a ground sampling distance um, where it's basically the size of the pixel. So it's what you can measure down to to the nearest 1.6 millimetre or 0.9 millimetres with the with the technology you've got and with the, the photo, um, uh, the, the cameras that are actually on the drones as well. So that's what we're looking at to see what accuracy. So here's here's um, the toe to nose measurements. Um, so the total station measurements. So we, we tried it with the tape, we tried it with the total stations, and we tried it with the drone. The tape, well, I'm trying to get the tape in the same place. Three people did it. We did a sort of repeatability check, if you like. Three people did it. Three people came up with three different answers. One was 10 mil out, one was 5 mil out. So it said, OK, it's not really a repeatable way, is it, with a fibre tape that you know we all used to measure with. Um, so we then used the total stations using an EDM, if you like, to, to measure it, and we got that figure. Um, and we did it a few times and that was fairly consistent. So we thought, let's stay with that. Um, so we did a toe to nose dimension and a nose to nose dimension. Uh, and then the, the, the drone, from the point cloud measurement, we, we went and zoomed and zoomed in and we found the toe position, the nose, nose position. We had to mark it for, to measure it and we had to physically measure it on the imagery. So it doesn't just go, bing, that's the measurement. We had to you know, go in and measure it like you would on a CAD screen. You know, you pick a point, pick a point. And we had the, the marks on the rails where we could sort of measure to. As you know, toe to nose is a lead dimension down 
down that switch rail, right end switch rail up to the, up to the nose. So we did that as you would do um, with a tape. And we got a 1.5 mil difference for the toe to nose and the nose to nose 2.8. And the nose to nose is probably because it, it is, it's, you know, you're looking at a nose position, it's not a defined position. You need to have a marker because it's got a ramp, it's got um, a topping on there. And unless it's marked and it's got a physical line that says where it is, it's, it's difficult to tell. So when you're trying to find an image, where is that? And, you know, I think that's why with the tape, you're like, where is it to? Where should we measure to, you know? Some crossings have a, like a weld mark to tell you where the actual nose is, some don't. Um, this particular one did have a, like a weld mark for the nose, but it's quite sort of wide, you know, um, uh, arc welded stamp on there. Um, so that was one of one of the things that we did find. So we're not far off, and the tolerance is actually 25 millimeters, but but that's a build tolerance, it's not a measurement tolerance. I would say we always used to say allow for three mil measurement tolerance with a tape or with the survey equipment we use. So we were within that three mil, so we were happy. Then we're looking at the uh, the sort of ortho photo, how we get an orthographic orthographic view because what the drone is, is is taking images at all the angles that then stitches them together to make a 3D view. Um, so we looked, what would the 3D view look like of the orthographic digital twin? So that's that's the imagery there. Um, you can then zoom in. I actually walked up and put a pencil line on one of the sleep one of the bearers. And I thought, well, when we get the imagery, let's try and find that sort of pencil line and see if it's there, because it could be a crack. And bearing number 50 or whatever it was, but down, and you could see the pencil line. So it can get down to like a pencil line image. Yes, you've got to scan for it and look for it, and because I knew it was there, you know, I could find it. You wouldn't have someone trading for every bear again, where's that crack? But you know, um, <laughs> but but you know, it's just it's just to see if there was a crack and if we did have a way of detecting cracks using other pattern recognition software or something else, could we see it? So that, that was the other sort of aim of, of the exercise as well. And then of course, you know, from, from a digital twin perspective, you know, if, if this file gets handed over to someone, they, they can then go, OK, it's got that clips, it's got those bolts, it's got that um, washer and that, that, you know, so all the parts there, and you can then add on other files and manuals and so on to it. So it all sort of collected together so they can say, oh, it has got those parts. We've got a drawing, we've got that, but that's actually what was built. And hopefully if we do it when it goes in the ground that's what was in the ground so you've got that 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 history and that record of, of the asset there um and that's sort of when you go onto the portal these views are on there that's the sort of the flat orthographic view on, on the top there so the uh, accuracy is, is quite good and we can like i said we can go and measure those some of those dimensions in 3d imagery or in the ortho flat imagery as well So on the uh, comparison between the supervisory inspections, where we've got all the, the on-site dimensions we took with a gauge, and ones that we took with the um, point cloud, which is the drone, you can see there the differences. So we've got ones, we've got minus ones, we've got twos. We've got a four mil there, which I think is A2, which is very close to the switches. It's a gauge within the sort of switch gauge at the second stretchy bar, it's A2. So we have four mil. Why is that four mil? Um, so we, we think the main reason for that, I um, think, is, is it's in that machining area. Um, it is by that time you have got a full, a full, I'd say, head and datum point to measure to. But it's still how the algorithm will work with the software to give you that sort of gauge point. So there's still some, I'd say, rounding up within the algorithm within that. But but we can teach that and we can say within certain areas, we can say apply a different algorithm within the switch. So it gives you a more accurate accurate reading. Um, having measured those measurements before with, with a gauge, you do find people generally are sort of within two mil of each other as well. So it is, it's never a sort of consistent reading. Um, so that's, that's what we found. So really, it, it was meeting our requirements. Um, OK, three mil there, but we've got it within three mil. You then say to yourself, what's more accurate, the gauge or the drone? And so it's then what do you want to rely upon? Repeatability and reproducibility, that's sort of R and R, or is it the manual measurement that you can see and you know works? So so that, that's the sort of debate you start having with yourself. Um, so as part of the BVI, the basic visual, we, we then walked up, myself and um, uh, Phil Winship actually, we walked the site, we, we did our own sort of inspections, picked up the, 
the defects that we saw visually. Um, so left hand slide plate is rubbing at the toe. Um, sand on the slide plates and those sort of crossing rail pads missing and slipped. So we then looked at the drone footage and see is that visible from the drone footage? And there was there was the two ground sampling distances, the 1.9. to see all of those visual mm. defects. Um, so again, if you're up there on here, you're looking for them, but you, you can, if you, if you know they're common defects, you can you can start to teach it to do those things. So, so you know, it, 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 it gained what it's supposed to do um, and it, it can do a BBI if you can talk, teach it how to. Uh, the one thing in doing this work, certainly with the gauge and the count readings we took, um, we had to look at the, the algorithm that Plam and Craven were applying to get all of that data. So the red line is the original count or the original gauge, and then the green line is the new applied algorithm that smooths off, takes off noise and gives you that, 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 that vision. So you can see in some cases it's actually adjusting it by one and a half to two mil. Um, and it's taking out the, and that algorithm was more in line with what we measured. Um, whereas the, the sort of, you know, we don't accurately measure every 500 millimetres or 200 millimetres. So the sampling at the moment is every 200 millimetres and we don't gauge that. So there's a lot of data there, a lot of information that it can suddenly, you know, so you want to try and apply a, um, a, that, that sort of statistical view of, of, of the data. And that's what the, the algorithm does. Um, and we've got that within 1.5 mil of, of the manual gauge reading. So, so again, we're, we're in the right ballpark. We then did some, uh, so, so within the algorithms, we did some rail string extractions. We, we looked at, um, and this is where we were looking at where we're measuring from, how hazy is the image? And you can see there, how much are we, are we actually um, accurately recording at the right point? Uh, and this is where the algorithm and the, the, the software was adjusted to look at this. Um, so the height of the rail string was improved by taking an approach by analysing the point cloud data and then looking at sampling patches of the data at the top of the rail. Um, and then they'll be able to derive the actual the height of the rail from that for your data in point 14 mil. It's trying to find that on a 3D image and you've got a point that's in the middle of the crown of the rail and a point that's on the side. You know, that's that's quite difficult. So that's what the algorithm was doing. Crossing wear and measurement. Um, so this is one of the images that came there. You can just see that chip. It's an old sort of point and splice fabricated crossing. Um, we then said, well, can we do a 2D profile to see if we can have we have a look at any if there's any wear there? So we did a cross section there. Quite a hazy image. Um, because what it's doing, it's taking about four or five sample sets and trying to sort of merge it into one through the algorithms and so on. So, um, but you know, we were able to sort of show there on the right hand side, you've got that sort of flange, um, hollow flange wear there on, on the side. Um, you couldn't see that from the imagery because it's it's probably too too detailed, but you can see it from the visual. Um, so, you know, we're not there for 054, but what you could, you know, for cast crossing inspections, but, but what you could, you get your relationship, you can get that your relationship between your wing rails and your, your point rail, so you can measure that and you get that, that dimension. You can look at if you've got a step in there and certain inclination, is that correct? You can measure that. Um, but you're talking within a one and a half minute accuracy, but it could be enough for you to say, ah, that's enough for me to now do a detail because I can see a problem there. I can see where that's going to be an issue I need now, need now to do. So it's not going to overtake 054, but when the accuracy comes, and I think the accuracy isn't there with drones to do this, it needs to be with the close field optical lasers that we use on, on, on our trolleys, then we can do that. So, But it could be enough just to steer a detailed inspection. We then gave this data set to a company called Pictera because we wanted to look at sort of pattern recognition. We, we've got, um, for those of you aware, we've got the plane line pattern recognition trains on the Western that does plane line track and, and takes images and then looks for deviations. It has some machine learning on, on where clips, ballast, other, other items on track should be. And if they're not there, it flags the issue. So we did some, so we took the area here, so we took this section here, this is the, called the training area, this is where you teach the model what to look for, and this is the testing area where you test that, you know, to see if, it, if it's um, performed that, that, that training. 
So here, for an example, we've got, um, we're running the detection um, and we're running it for clips. So there's 150 Pandrel clips identified across three images within seconds, boom. Um, so it's automatically counting numbers. So it, it could say, right, within a certain field, you've got 150, and then it can come back and measure it again and say there's only 148 now, there's some missing. Um, but it can also identify where they're missing by, by again, teaching it how to do that. And you can see some missing ones there that have been, been circled. So we then said, OK, what about bolts? So screw, uh, coach screws and so on. Can we detect where they are? And if they're missing, they're broken or, or not, shipped, not seen. Um, and teach you how to do that. And the same for the surface of the bearer. So the surface of the bearer, if there's a crack, I mean, those small areas there, they're ballast on top. But if there was a crack, i.e. it's lower than the main sort of surface of the bearer, it's indented, or then that would come up as well. Um, and you can play around with the accuracy of that as well. So we then took those different images. We, we went out in March 21 to do the survey, that's the initial survey. Then we went back out in September 21 to do a survey afterwards, and we sort of married that. So this is where I'm going to try and go on to that link. So there's a link there, which is the PICTERA website. Um, I might need to just connect up here for a second. Yep, I'm in. OK, so you can see a green line there. So the, that, that green line basically divides two, two inspections, the one in March and the one in September. So if I go in, I know Phil's trying to do this online. Good mm -hmm. luck to you, Phil. So if I go into these areas that have got um, the hazard exclamation marks are areas where they've detected something missing, a pat, a clip or something missing. So, so it's saying, look in on this area. So, so if we zoom in on these, let's have a look at one. I'll wait for it to catch up. Hello? It's not bad imagery really, is it, for a drone that's 20 meters up? But, um, so, on the left, I can slide this across now. So on the left, you've got a clip there. OK, the exclamation mark's right on, isn't it? And then there's a clip there. OK, but if you look on the right hand side, that clip's gone. It's broken. It's in the ballast now. So what it's actually detected is that clip was there in March. It's now gone. It's not telling me half of it's in the ballast, but it's showing you there's a problem. So you're able to sort of say, OK, we've got clips missing there. <laughs> um, Another another example was back here. I will go over to here. So purple, I've got a clip there in March. And in September, someone put a rail pad over it. I don't know who that was, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just check in. <laughs> yeah, so it's picked up. Ah, something's moved. So, you know, it's it's. The level of accuracy, we actually looked into stretcher bars. So I'm going to try this. It, it's a bit slow, but let's have a you have to bear with me on this one, Phil. Yeah, it's fine. I'm following you. <laughs> I'm going to go to the toe. <laughs> People online are doing this except for a laptop. <laughs> the two screens don't quite match. OK. <laughs> I'm moving it too fast, but it might catch up. How long have we got? <laughs> Here it comes. So here's the toe. I'm going to go onto this stretcher bar. I'm going to go zoom in as high as I can. There's the rod, there's a stretcher bar. Here we go. There it is there. So that that is, ooh, that's the nearest I could, well, I could probably go a little bit nearer. Let's just go out to give you, give it a helping, some chance of coming in. <laughs> Your online one is a lot better than my one. <laughs> I'm just seeing it on there. I'm, yeah, I'm waiting. Yeah, yeah, you're waiting, aren't you? Yeah. On, online, online people are getting better than me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you can just see the level of the, you can see the nuts there on the stretcher bar, um, uh, the, the two, uh, the four nuts that are there on the stretcher bar. So if, if you were to white line those, or even if you were just to compare faces of the nuts, you could go between the two, there you go, duh, duh, like that, and see if they've moved. 
So that's that's the whole idea of it. You can see other things that may have moved as well. I mean, you, it's interesting to see how the vegetation grows over six months, but not that it, you don't really need to worry about that too much. But and where cans and other bits of um, debris come from, you know. But but you can you can look inside and see if other other things. So it's good for that if we if we were able to sort of mark up witness mark bolts and nuts and, and things that are critical for s and inspection we can then zoom in and go oh yeah it has moved you know, we've got a loose 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 nut there or someone's been out and adjusted it of course but we, we check the maintenance records so so that's that's that um i'll now go back to the presentation so yes yeah, so that's as far as we've got with drones uh and they're still doing more work within InterTraffic, which is um, work that Phil Winship is doing. They're still looking at the accuracy. Um, some of the routes have actually got their own drones that they're using to do uh, plane line inspections with. Um, so the SNC inspection for drones hasn't really come in yet, but um, some of the uh, suppliers, so VAE and Progress Rail, are keen to see the outputs of this as well and keen to see whether they can use drones for their inspections instead of using um, personnel to, to measure them and so on. So, um, so um, going on to uh, a prefabrication inspection, um, when we looked at the, the type of things you need to, to measure for inspections, we then looked at the, the, the types of S&C you have and the type of the things that you, or the, the, the inspection criteria that you need to apply. So we looked at a standard bearer layout, a modular tie plated layout, and then to the right was a, a direct fix layout. So that could be for, for London Underground or for any um, direct fix concrete layout where we may have base plates separate or no, no bearer, you know, connecting the two. Um, so we looked at uh, all the different um, items we inspect and, and then looked at, you know, how critical it was that you, me you measured those. In some cases, it, um, it drove us to what we needed to inspect for a, a sort of direct fix layout or a, a, an individual block layout where you didn't have bearers. Uh, and we were able then just to use this just to compare and say, OK, we need to adopt this inspection method for that type of SNC to make sure we get those sort of critical dimensions. Um, and that's one of the sort of junction work inspection forms that we use for, for London Underground, which is developed around sort of 10, 10 years ago, I think. Um, and we, we did go into quite a lot of detail about the closed switch rail gaps and the switch fits. So we measure every every bearer to make sure we, we know um, accurately where where the switch is fitting up against the stock rail. Um, and then we can also, with this form, we looked at um, the free switch inspection. So when the switch is actually on its own, it's not got a point equipment attached to it or any drive attached to it, is to see if there's any flex or any movement or if it's not sitting accurately. So it's called a sort of a spring and free switch test. So you're then able to determine whether the switch, you know, is fit and it is, is moving, it's moving up to the stock rail and there's nothing stopping it um, or it's not curved correctly um, or there could be some bias or uh, curvature in the switch that causes it to spring open as well. So, so that sort of a enables you to detect that. Uh, then we sort of looked into the the other parts of um, of S and C when we come to the installation. So there's always that point when you are installing the track, you've installed the S and C, and you're then about to hand over to the signals point fitters to do their part. So they then have to set up the switches. Before the point fitter comes along, he wants to know or she wants to know that you've got. Um, your alignment's correct, you're within a certain tolerance. If, if he's trying to sort of make a switch work against um, alignment that's got twist or that's got um, misalignment, and you know, the misalignment may be five mil one way, five mil the other way over, over a short distance, but it's enough for the switch not to fit. So it's giving the, the, the uh, signal installer um, that sort of um, uh, reassurance that the as built track that, that they've installed um, at Post tamping is actually good enough for the, the point machine, the put the, the sorry the, the signal um, installer to then set up to, and then they can measure and record their findings as well for stretcher bars and, and so on. So it's like a handover form really between track and signals. You can see signals will come along, start to to um, to to do their work, 
and not realise that actually the track isn't in the position it should be. It could be well off. So they're trying to make it fit. But And in trying to make it fit, they could put a problem in there. So you need to make sure you know, you're know, you you're aware how far from design the switch is. And the, the form on the right, that is a, a handback form. So for in bearer clamp lock, there's various handback forms where they measure the um, critical dimensions, SO openings and, and flange ways, and again, gauge readings, so that they can then say that it was the, the um, in bearer clamp lock um, was installed and set up with these dimensions. And, that can then be handed over to the maintainer. So they've got a record of it as well. So just, just going to go through a little bit on um, S&C inspection um, and the problem areas that we get with, with inspecting um, once we install s and I won't go for every line, it's there for people to, to look into at their own time, but um, here is a list of, of all the different critical aspects of s and c um, the component um, that we're measuring um, and really it's this is the, the the issue observed so this is the problem that we're having um, so one example there cast crossing so cant measurements being taken on the nose topping so where the nose drops off people putting gauge on there and they're going why is this cant off by five mil so well you shouldn't be measuring gauge on a, on the nose because it has topping and it's dropped down you know measure it further back so in some cases we have to inform people we have to inform surveyors um, they may be using a trolley so it's a case of like um, uh, informing the surveyors and engineers as well and installers that actually you can't measure the can out of nose um, so this went through some of the issues we were having during the installation some of the issues of coming up from people measuring or inspecting it incorrectly um, so i think the top one there on stocks and switches Incorrect drilling of distance block positions causing incorrect switch to stop fit. Um, so in some cases, the distance block um, wasn't in the position it should be, um, which is odd because you think actually it's an automated process. On London Underground, we did have, um, we had CNC manufacturing sort of capabilities to do that, but sometimes they may put the wrong distance block in, sometimes it may be in the wrong position. Um, uh, people play around with parts as well. So, so we're you know, measuring those switch drilling positions to make sure we know it's in the correct place. Um, and that could be something, it could be on an old set of S&C that's been out there for a long time and someone's changed something or, or moved something or it's an old design. So, um, so yeah, that, that goes through um, all sorts of issues we have. It goes on to another page, we might go on to that as well, but it goes on to another page, shadow their base plates, concrete bearers. And, the, the one thing that we, we did use this for was modular tie plates when, when they were introduced to try and understand what else do we need to check, what else do we need to inspect and measure. We were finding that coil washers weren't always being installed on the, on the bolts and that could cause premature failure of the bolt. Um, incorrect bolt length going in so they were causing the bearer to crack because they would ground um, uh, into the concrete and, and split the concrete. Bearer, any, bearer end pads not installed, um, bearers skewed or stuck to install, and they're using the tie plate to align them, you know. Um, so things like that, and then we gave sort of guidance and, and um, instructions on how to do it. So we produced an O&M manual for, for S&C, modular bearers, and briefing sessions as well, and we go through with the installers to make sure. We even put sort of design tolerance, installation tolerances to, to um, alignment between the two panels as well when they're being installed um, because because we're aware of that problem. Conductor rail I think, was a big issue for us on London Underground, a room, so insufficient room for the pot to go in certain layouts and the slipper ones that we have and incorrect offsets of the alignment of the insulator potholes as well. So lots of issues there as well. And same with point operating equipment as well. So going forward, how do you see the inspection of s and and what is the future? So in terms of a digital twin, these are sort of the inputs we would see an s and digital twin and what would make a digital twin. So we, we start off with a 3D design with the installed model. So that's complete with the switch, the crossing, all the POE, profile drawings of, 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 of or CAD drawings and all the profiles of the switches and crossings, and a whole inventory of, for the asset register. Um, then in terms of the system, the system O&M manual that, that 
that's a, an early manual for everything, not just the track parts, but the signal parts as well, and one that combines the two, because in some cases there's gaps or overlap, and it's difficult to know, do you adjust the stretchy bar, or do you adjust the gauge, or do you adjust the POE? So, so there's those sort of things, and any videos, maintenance tasks, track workers information, TWIs, um, the spares, the tools, the training, the competency that you need to adjust any of this equipment as well, um, and skills, and if there's training out there where you go to for the training. Then you're sort of going into its, its use and operation, so in terms of sort of the signal and track, you know, it's, it's, gained, it's obtaining all the failure data, the maintenance history and all the work that's been undertaken, it's all formed part of this portal of information. You then apply to so another part of the digital twin could be a degradation model. So we apply a degradation model of what it could look like once it's degraded and unsafe or, or um, its asset life is, is just you know expired. Um, so then we can apply how long would it take to get to that and what do we need to, to do to make sure it doesn't get to that or to prolong its life. So we sort of do some prediction on the frequencies of grinding, welding, parts replacement, POE adjustment, when we should tamp. Um, and it can then also predict, if we continue that, it predicts what the residual life would be of the asset as well, if we continue with those, those maintenance activities. So looking at doing that, we need to sort of validate that, that information by doing asset condition monitoring to make sure it's, it's degrading in the same sort of rate. Um, so so it's data from the point machine, data from the points heating, digital void meters, so your, your, your Connex or your Swix void meter systems that you can use. Um, which have accelerometers in them as well. Um, so track mounted sensors, because at the moment we're using TRV or track recording vehicle measurements, which is train born. We're not using anything that's, that's actually track born. So we know what the train's doing on the track. We don't know what the track is actually doing under the train. Uh, is it voiding? Is it is it spreading? Is it doing all these other things? So it's having those void, those on track sensors that, that give us that information. And those sensors are becoming a lot more popular now um, to do that sort of combined diagnostics. So if you get all of that information together and you can do a combined diagnostic with it, then you've, you've got, you can then start to see the relationship between different data sets as well. Uh, dynamic measurement data, so that's track recording vehicles, as I said, so that can be overlaid. Um, rail condition and pattern recognition, we can put the pattern recognition stuff, we can put the drone pattern recognition in there as well. And we can also have the sort of geographical GIS mapping or oh, the snake grid, as we call it, that's got the um, the the alignment of the the all the plane line around it and the SNC. So that's all the top sort of topographical data. Um, and it with that you could also include um, drainage, earthworks if there's earthworks movements, if there's drainage data as well. So you can have a full system model. Um, that's sort of the next step. And so it's sort of widening out to all the other assets, OHLE or third rail and so on. Um, and then we've still got the static gauge measurements that we take, um, which some of them are manual, some of them are semi-automatic, but we can replace those with drones or the Felix that you saw there, and we can verify those by sort of dynamic measurements as well. So, so it's, it's bringing everything together into that digital twin to, to hopefully prolong the life. In terms of the sort of inspection processes that we currently have, we've got two ways we measure SNC. We measure it statically or dynamically. Um, if you sort of run down the, the measurement we take and then to look at how we currently measure it. So do we measure it statically with a gauge with the person measuring and no train, so it's no, no movement, versus what we might do um, dynamically with a track recording vehicle or um, the new measurement train, as we call it now, um, and then to see, well, how would you like to measure that that, that certain dimension? So what, one example is a flange way. So if you were to measure a flange way dynamically, that flange way could be increased because the vehicle wheel or the wheel has actually forced it to open. So you're measuring a dynamic flange way, albeit it could be moving and you can see it going in and out, in and out as, as the wheel travels through. But do you want to measure it dynamically or would it be better to measure it statically so you know what it is statically before the vehicle actually you know, goes into it? So there's some measurements where we, we're trying to work out where would we best measure it, static or, or dynamic or both in both senses and trying to understand which is the safer way, what, what gives us the an answer that gives us a safer you know, 
uh, a safer SNC and, and, and in some cases maybe a reliable SNC as well. So that's what sort of the aim of that exercise was to do was was to sort of compare those sort of those dimensions and what we might measure. So one example is residual switch openings. Um, so currently measured dynamically. No, we can't measure them because generally they're closed up <laughs> by the by the wheels. So <laughs> so we can't measure them, but we want to measure them statically because we want to know is there movement? And if that movement occurs, then we know other things can start to happen with the point operating equipment, other fatigue can start to sort of set in as well. Slide plate gap, so that the gap between the slide plate and the switch, you know, it's always been a bugbear. How do we measure that? Because there's no sort of automated, automated way of measuring it. And we need that for, for other, other um, sort of, uh, P8 and 053 dimensions to see that sort of relationship between the stop and switch. And also, you know, a big gap means we've got a problem because somewhere you're going to have um, a, um, either, uh, uh, a switch that's not bearing evenly on the slide surfaces or you've got some voiding happening. So, you know, sort of detecting that as well. So that's the idea of that and cast crossing profiles. And so they're sort of main areas we'd inspect and looking at sort of static versus versus dynamic. So if you if you're looking at automating all of these processes together, um, we looked at um, what we do under BVI. So there is a tactile nature to BVI. We 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 kick things. How I don't know how many of you used to kick bolts and <laughs> you know I, I was out last night and I was sort of twisting because I couldn't kick because I had to twist because I could, you know and it's like well we can't do that with a drone but you know but it's looking at those sort of things that we we like to do that because we know it will tell us if it's moving or if it's if it's loose or you know, so kicking for loose bolts. And then there may be some dirt on there. So what we remove the dirt and we see, oh, actually, yes, it has moved, or there's some dirt sort of hiding something there. Touching surfaces, you know, we touch surfaces to see is there heavy lipping or, or is there sort of corrugation and those sort of things in there. We stamp on bearers and stamp on sleepers. That's the sort of sleeper integrity test, isn't it? You know, that you do to see, oh yeah, that's a sound one. Good. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know of any other sleeper integrity tester other than stamping the bearer, but um <laughs> Um, and grease carryover, so grease just goes on everything and you need to sort of move it out of the way. And then we've got visual accuracy, so it's, it's, it's can we see a hairline crack? Can we see, um, you know, looking at the top and line, our eyes can look at the top and line. I don't know how many photos you've looked at and you go, that looked nothing like when I looked, when I was out there from a photo, and, you know, and then you get a load of, you know, coordinates and information. So, yeah, still not telling me anything, you know, when I saw it by eye, it didn't look right, you know. You know? And that, uh, you know, lots of good um, permanent way inspectors would say that to you. And in some cases, you might have to prove them wrong by giving them, there's the as built. <laughs> but I do agree, there's a slight niggle there, but yeah. Um, or, you know, um, or you actually say, no, it's, it's visible, but not by the, you know, the, the measurements we've taken, but it does look like there's a problem, I'll say. Um, correct parts, visual accuracy, um, assemble correctly, missing parts, hold switches. Clashing parts, you know, where you get parts that clash, they don't allow the switch to move. Um, and then the, you sort of go into that sort of telltale signs or some, you do a root cause in your head, you go, ah, yeah, well, that's because that and that is failing. You know? So you do a sort of fault combination type of thing, or you know, there's a repeating fault, there's a history there, it's always happened, it's going to happen again, but that's when you should do a root cause, but you know, but, but you, you know, you expect to see that, or, or it could be inherent by design as well. So. Um, ballast formation condition. We look for those those sort of things, and some of those again slightly tactile, slightly visual. But we, you know, plane line pattern recognition is trying to measure the profile of, of shoulders. So for, for critical rail temperature, you know, and, and CRT management and buckling, it's going to be really useful for that because then we can see we've got you know lack of ballast, so it's it's a it's a high risk site. You know, those are sort of things we used to do visually. Can we do that now with with other means? Drainage, you know, lifting up the catch bit, looking at seeing if it's full up and, and those sort of things. Earthworks, we see raveling of ballast and uh, mechanical. So all of these things, you know, you know, how are we going to actually adopt these into an automated process? And pattern recognition may tick some of these, um, but it, it's still, I think, a, a long way away from from getting there to the to the detail. But what it can do, it can initiate the need for this. So we can say, actually, we think there could be a problem with that. 
and then it could, you know, we don't have to go out and inspect it every month, we then go out and inspect it every year or six months because we've got all of the other data there that sort of backs up the safety of, of the line. So if we were to adopt all of that, what we've just discussed about digital twins and inspections and automating things, so the, the sort of future UK practice, um, not here yet, maybe 2025, 20, 2030, 20, um, with the, the app, you know, the I guess the more use of BIM and, and digital data and so on. That's how we then collect the, the 3D scanned layout. The delapidation survey can be done in 3D as well. We can drone over the, the, the delap survey. We can do verification surveys with the 3D image overlaid on top of the actual track and do, do verification with that. We can do, we'll have system owner manuals, asset management regime um, that we can upload. So we have that all pre pre ready to go. We just we just um, select the, the the tools that that are needed for that. Full parts catalog, um, and then sort of the one to two hundred general arrangement design and a three D model of that as well. Um, you know we we go into some of the projects I've been on where I see a BIM model or a PIM model, and then I say why have we still got two lines for track and every other discipline have got their nice 3D image. We should have shown rail, sleepers, crossfall, ballast, shoulders, you know, not just two little lines going through. You know? So, mm. so it's, it's sort of having that ability to do that um, and having a 3D track image that goes. And then we can import the, the, the 3D scan into that as well from, from, the, um, from the layout in the yard. Uh, and installation, it, this all carries through, you know, this is, this is an ongoing um, model that we use, then we hand it over into installation. We then look at um, the whole layout. We um, incorporate the geometry verification, ITP evidence as well. <clears throat> Any standardised installation maintenance tasks we do, um, the BIM model that gets handed over, that becomes the digital twin. Um, the maintainer then has that and has access to it. becomes part of the Ellipse or or Maximo system that we go into. Um, and then for maintenance, we can do. Uh, more informed fault condition, FMS, failure mode sort of um, analysis on, on, on the SNC using a pan recognition, the digital twin model, dynamic autonomous geometry you know, that, that, that we get along with any other um, measurements we'll take. Um, mobile track behaviour monitoring, so that's the actual if you want to put sensors down, <coughs> it's employing those as well. And drainage and earthworks <coughs> monitoring as well, so it's part of that. How am I doing for time? Yeah, fine. <laughs> I think so. I've got about 10 minutes left, I think, of this. So, so just a little bit of work we, we did um, um, in, in New York. So we were working in New York um, for MTA, um, for the Metro. And we were looking at the, um, the, the um, reliability of their SSC <clears throat> and the reliability of track as a, as a whole as well. Um, so we worked a lot on the elevated lines, so they're the lines that are like 30 foot in the air with cars whizzing underneath you and I think that's me there on, at Coney Island, um, being careful not to drop my tape measure through the gap because it could hit a car underneath um, and where you stand as well. So you've got live conductor rail everywhere and you, you know, you're stepping sort of precariously. Um, <clears throat> so it's quite an interesting um, uh, environment to work in. Um, but generally, you know, 1912 construction, I would say the track is of the same era. <laughs> they're, they're, nothing's really changed. They're, that point machine is from sort of the, the early 30s. Um, and Alstom sort of point machine is a mixture of air systems and electric systems there. Um, a 100 pound rail and 115 pound rail. Timber used quite a lot. Um, and some of the bearers actually form part of the, um, the, the walkway as well. So they extend out. And then the walkway is laid on top of them, so it's not just a bearer for the SSC, it's a bearer for the whole whole system. So it, it's a sort of structural member, and that's why they're so deep as well. Uh, and yeah, and a lot of the problems is is they they have a, a divide between track and signals, so we were trying to sort of close that gap. And they have a joint switch inspection process that we were looking into, and we wanted to um, see what 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 they weren't picking up what was becoming a problem and looking at a lot of their failure data. So we did a sort of, uh, um, some training, we provided some training, we looked at all the common failure modes with, with all their varying assets, not just SNC, but also track circuits and, and other, other uh, train stops and other pit parts of their equipment. 
Um, so we, we, we did inspection considering reliability, condition rather than safety, or on top of safety, should I say. Um, their inspection techniques, an explanation of what's a wheel rail interaction, how that can affect what you make, what you ins inspect. Um, we in introduced some sort of step gauges and other measurement sort of devices so that they could actually measure uh, things they weren't measuring before. And we're also sort of determining the root cause for a lot of their problems as well. Um, and this became sort of reliability inspection form that they were then following. So, uh, and we were sort of training them on that as well. We gave them a, sort of a few headlines. So on the left there, we've got sort of track condition we were seeing um, when we have voiding, so voiding the structure or voiding it in the tunnel, um, where where that could lead to sort of the, the high vertical acceleration of vibration. What could happen to the signal equipment with that? They also added the old the old style heel joint, which is a sort of an articulated joint that can move, which we, we tried to sort of you know try to persuade them to to go into sort of a, a newer 1980s approach, but um, they still like that design. I don't know why. Um, but they had all sorts of issues with thermal expansion on that and, and joints being packed incorrectly and reliability issues with that. Um, so we were just we were just basically coming up with what, what sort of track condition and how that can affect certain parts and the descriptions we were seeing. Um, we had a lot of obstructions on, on the um, elevated section. There's actually baskets underneath the switches to collect all the broken bolts so they don't fall on the trains <laughs> below. Um, and they, when they get full up, <laughs> Because they get full up with cans of these. When they get full up, they can then start to obstruct other things like the switches and so on. But so people should regularly sort of pick them. And some of the baskets have got holes. But you know, you, might, you know, if, you, if a bolt does break off and it goes, you've got a car, you've got, you've got a claim there. So yeah. you've got to try and stop that from happening. And, um, and water ingress was a, a very big issue. We did a lot of work around um, post hurricane Sandy, where some of the tunnels were submerged in three foot of water. So a lot of the assets were sort of um still still affected by that that um so they have track pumping issues <clears throat> but generally a lot of the, the the surface water in in manhattan drains into the subway and in onto the track so how do you how do you move it away you know we're going up to some switch machines and you have to sort of ask the tramp to move out of the way because that's where they sleep mm -hmm. um so you can get to it uh, and um you know and and then you've got all the other problems you look up and you see all this water just just flushing down so it's quite a, quite an interesting thing. We did some explanation of what flange back contact. A lot of people remember this drawing from post Grey Rig in, in the RSSB reports and so on. So we sort of explained to them, you know, what the phenomenon is about um, flange back contact, how it can affect point operating equipment and stretcher bars and, and so on. So we gave them a, a bit a bit of, sort of teaching on that. Um, and they do have a they have a, another system in there which is called a house top. <clears throat> I've got a photo of it, but if I go back, yeah, so bottom right hand corner, you've got those four slide plate strokes sort of large base plates. That's a plate called a house top, which is a like a check rail for the switch to go underneath. And it provides um, sort of a like a check rail through the open turnout switch, switch side, but also when the switch comes over, it can can obviously come through. So it, it's basically fully guarding, if you like, the, the switch. Um, so they have issues with that, a lot of issues with that switch obstructing, the house top sort of bending down, uh, people packing it with washers and doing all these other things as well. Um, so that was, you know, and and you've got a thing under there called a switch stop, which the switch stops up against because you are you have to have it in a fixed open position to provide a check rail support, you know. Uh, off the back of it so you that those were very loose and then the feedback from that was going back into the point machine so we're, we're teaching you know teaching them that that's quite a, a reliable although they didn't see it as a safety issue but it's a reliability issue other, other things circuit controllers and parts within the machines that just can't cope with the vibration were, were being damaged because of those that contact and that movement um and we did a little bit of um, sort of analysis. We went into some of the signal control rooms and we, we used a flute meter. So we'd go in and um, this is what during, during train operation, we'd go in and, and uh, clip this around one of the fuses on the points. Um, and then we can do a sort of current draw over time analysis. 
like you do with remote condition monitoring, you can do current draw over time, but they didn't have, they're on two sites, but we were able to do sort of, you know, condition monitoring ad hoc on whatever switch we want to do by, by doing this in the, in the signal room. Um, and then we can sort of see what some of the symptoms are as well. So we sort of had a curve, we explained what the sort of various phases of that, that current draw was, the sort of unlocking phase, where your clutch setting may be incorrect, and the start of the drive phase, the start of the locking phase. And if you get a wiggly line, that could be friction or something, you know, sort of, sort of rubbing. A lot of their components used to rub on the side of bearers um, because of the thermal movement, like stretcher bars and rods used to rub quite a lot. So you could sometimes see that on a, on a, on a, on a draw, on the um, current drawer as well. And uh, each point machine had its own sort of clutch setting, you know, in terms of amps, we were able to see if they've clutch if they've um, set it too high or too low, and then you get overdrive and you get other things sort of, sort of happening there. So that is it, yeah. Um, so I guess from some of that other learning from, from what I saw in, in, in New York, <coughs> is then realizing that uh, in the UK, we probably don't, well, we don't inspect in terms of reliability. We inspect for safety because that's sort of the main part. We look at dimensions, we look at those things we know cause accidents, but what are those sort of precursors that become a reliability issue and how can we inspect for them? So that's sort of the, 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 the focus on what we did in New York. And some of the inspections that, that we do do in, in London Underground and, and sort of other people are trying to adopt is how we do inspect for reliability as well. That's it, open, open the floor for um, questions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Take a seat. Yeah. Obviously, if there's anyone listening from home who'd like to ask a question, please drop Phil a, a message and uh, we'll come to you um, accordingly. So, is there anyone in the room who has? Um, uh, Darren, a question about the formation, drainage, and kind of the underlying factors for, for support switching, crossing, and things like that. So, we've talked a lot. Sort of in detail about the kind of the top levels I would describe, so sleepers, componentry, stuff above the ground. Do you think, in your experience, in your opinion, that we actually spend enough time looking at what's below the ground yeah. in terms of kind of the root cause? We generally look at root cause and think, why is that switch continuing to fail? Why is it that when we pack it, it moves? Do you think, in your experience, we spend enough time, effort, and probably money on? What's no, we don't. You're right, Mark. Um, we, it's all what's visible and what's what we can get to with a probe or with a tape measure or, or with inspection. But, you know, we, we we did some some work within Intertrack to on track bed um, monitoring. So looking at the track bed at the formation to ballast side, um, and this was to look at sort of asphalt track track formations, um, and then see how that that works and whether whether we can sensor. We can sort of put sensors in, whether they're um, optical sensors, um, fibre optics going through to see if we can measure voiding, measure um, shear in, within that sort of area or any um, uneven surfaces. But we don't do enough of that. I don't. I think we just like the shiny things that are on. We like the shiny things that are on top of the. Um, <laughs> you want me to get in the camera here? Yeah, that, that, that way I can get you both on at the same yeah, yeah. time. So you're, you're a bit separate at the moment. You've, you've, there so we, we don't do enough. De in depth, <laughs> I'd say monitoring underneath the sleeper. We can do uh, the sensors at the moment will do sort of acceleration and void deflection and so on. But you know, I'd like to know well, is that the ballast or is it the formation or is it something else? Is it seasonal as well? Is it soil? You know, all those other things that we that we get. And if, if we did have uh, monitoring in drainage, I guess monitoring in earthworks. Uh, monitoring um, within that we could put, I guess, a monitor down into the ballast, into the formation that, that could tell us that um, that would be ideal. But it'll just keep coming back. And this, unless we, we recognise that actually, no, that is a problem. We can see it, but but it's not vis visual. But it's um, maybe a underlying um, formation condition. Yeah. So I agree. I guess the question was more around my observation of we've always treated drainage S and C with huge level of importance because it's probably the one place that you need to make sure things are as static as possible in terms of the robustness, the stiffness that you then give to the track of it. But just, yeah. Yeah, 
it's an, it's an interesting area we can talk about all night. It, it is, and it's how many how many different types of sensing monitoring systems can we apply to a set of SNC? Before we know, we could have 10, 15 different sets of data gathering devices. Um, but that's maybe what it takes. Yeah. Thank you. Just I'll go to somebody from home. It's it's always good. Um, there's a question, uh, Peter Halliwell. If you'd like to turn your microphone on and ask your question. Good evening. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I think yeah, so. We can yeah, we can hear you, Peter. Yeah, oh, yeah. Good. Darren, what a fabulous talk. Really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, the, the question I'd like to um, ask you is in relation to the digital universe that you described. So, so we've now got the technology and the wherewithal to, to create a very accurate and maintained parallel digital universe. But do you see the appetite and the capability being put in place for that to survive beyond the project stage. It, it's clearly there to support the project stage, but do you see it getting into the O&M stage where it's found, for years and years it's founded to be established, getting BIM beyond commissioning, getting um, anything else that you've described to be sustained in, throughout the O&M? Uh, I, I, I see that as a block up here, I, I think. Projects that invest in this this technology and they want to do a BIM model for clash reasons, clash detection, and all of the other sort of disciplines to make sure nothing um, it all works together. Um, then the line stops because the maintainer doesn't have either the processes to manage that information, the resources to actually collect it, identify the problems, analyze it. Um, and we don't have standards either that back that up because we're using it and reporting in different ways. I think slowly as we we change, I guess, to automated inspection, we are changing standards to sort of to align with that inspection process. Um, but what we don't have is an asset management plan that says if that's what the project doing, why aren't we doing this in maintenance that aligns with that? And that's not there and it, it needs a joint funding because it's a capex versus opex isn't it it's that it's that that scenario where we're getting a new technology but if you're not careful we're not going to have the processes or the capability to be able to maintain it to that digital level that we're talking about and and the blockers are i think are just two different funding streams you know we, we get innovation we get investment from new projects it's thou shall put the best in and we shall monitor it but it's like, well, actually, within the maintenance world, we don't have any of the resources to do that, you know. And unless you line the two up um, and you have an asset management strategy that, that aligns the two, then you're not going to get that. And so it is a blocker. It is. And, and I think we've done all the work in new technology and the introduction of new technology. But we now need to bring the maintainer up to that same level. Um, either with, and they're getting there with 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 new sensors and other things that they realise that that's missing from the toolbox now, um, and I think they're starting to realise they need a, they need that digital twin themselves. They're making a version of of different asset data sets, you know, <clears throat> but they could do with that dashboard that they can look at and go. Ah. So yeah, it, it is it is a problem, and it could how long it lasts for I don't know. Whether it's going to last through GBR. <laughs> whether we get a bigger divide between um, you know installation and the maintainer which is where some of that happened if we were it was the old glory days where we were the same outfit we could we could align budgets to make sure it is continuous throughout but this could be sort of a, a step that we just you know um, trip up at because we don't have that investment in maintenance I certainly think out of what you've shared with us tonight, there's a huge amount there that could help make the case for sustaining the virtual railway beyond commissioning. Yes. Yeah, and, that, and that's probably what it would take if we do the business analysis and say, well, you know, if you had this, you would stop those failures from occurring that improve your reliability. You know, for a one million spend, you'd get 20 million, you know, um, payback. You know, it's those sort of things that, that we need to start doing next so people then do invest. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Peter. Thank you, thank you for your uh, question. Malcolm, you, you were trying to get a question out. Darren, top class stuff tonight. Um, thank you, Malcolm. Which makes it even more relevant that I should ask you your opinion on uh, a few reservations that I have about 
the whole system. First of all, saying that that, uh, that the the videos, the drones, and so on, and what the sort of things they can produce for you. I have really no problem that technology will allow us to get to have all the programs in them that you require to be able to look at all the individual details and so on. I, I accept all that, and that that, mm. that can be done. I'm worried about two things. First of all, this competency. Yes. That is the fact that you're going to take away manual inspections by whoever that might be, and replace it by people literally sitting in an office and looking at the data. Mm. It doesn't give you, I, from my point of view, the same feel. It doesn't give you the same, um, you, you're not going to be able to a particular fault. It's never one thing, like a derailment, it's never one thing, mm. it's always, always a number of, a number of things. So I'm just worried that in the future you're going to get um, a, a nucleus of people who have actually never faced it for real on the track. Yeah. And I cannot, after 60 odd years on the railway, I, I cannot get to the stage where you never go out on the track and mm. cannot be right for me and that the next bit to it is to to, to couple on to that um is if i was going out to inspect an ssc layout first of all i would hope that i inspected that same layout a number of times previously so that i know the things very well when you go out there, I don't want to measure anything in the first place. I want to watch a number of trains over it. Mm -hmm. And the number of trains over it will tell me an awful lot of things about that layout and the way that the layout is responding to the trains that's passing over it. And it will take you right down to the ballast conditions as well. To watch it will see the voidings. You then will concentrate on the places that are likely to be causing the faults you see with the train passing over it. Now, there's all sorts of things with the new measurement train that will give you alignment of all these sort of things. And I will be quite happy to go back and look at all those things. But I needed to put in my own mind in the first place now what's wrong with this layout why are we not running very well because the one thing that i've not said there is that before i went out and inspected it i went on the train ride over it as well yeah so but that so it it's all that that's picked up in in the slide where we're trying to look at basic you know automating basic yeah, all those things are absolutely right yeah and you missed and, out the, the train running over then, it. and there's also the audible Okay, an there's an audible exactly. inspection that we do. So there's the train, there's the observation on the load, and there's the audible that you, you, hear, you hear something going over the crossing, you don't need to see, you go, that's not right. Um, and, and they're all things that we can't replicate with, with any other condition monitoring. You're absolutely right. In, in some cases, we're being forced to have a safe railway where it's red zone, you know, um, permitted, so you, where you can't actually access the railway. So how do we inspect autonomously? Um, and what will give, what will actually go. And one of it will be the expertise in, in engineers knowing the problems, engineers going out to look at it, when the, those future engineers could be people that just have a look up menu and go, oh, it's this, it's this. And that's not an engineer, that's just, uh, you know. And but I think what we are finding is how people learn nowadays is different to how we used to learn. And how people look up items and how people expect to have everything visually and very in front of them where whereas lots of things were ingrained in our minds and attention span is one thing that changes how you take on information is one thing that changes so so that there is a step change in how people take on information how they use information as part of their job so that that is happening um and it's it's you know people do need to go on to I see there's been in the last what, 10 years a lot more YouTube videos and stuff because people like to see it on a video, you know, and they, they get it that way and they see it nice stuff, rather than reading through 10 different tables and a load of clauses in the standard, you know. Um, so there's 
there's there's that sort of thing as well that that we I guess we do need to adapt for that because people's uh, you know um, the, the the way the human being is now reacting now their brain works is different to how it used to react 50 years ago so we've got to take that on board as well and how we train people how competence is done for the future and we're not going to have that engineer that that you're right can st stand by the track and go I know what this problem is and it is a collection of this this and this. And and it's it's and I think one of the, one of the items there says those causal factors that are combined factors that you probably won't be able to get from any data sets. It's just a bit of that, a bit of that, a bit of that, and that's why that that is failing. And we aren't there yet. And it, but I guess with not having that, what is the consequence? Is what we've got to understand. What's the risk? What's the impact? Yeah. Um, and and that's why I did that slide because I said there could there could still be something there that we're not doing and if we're not careful we're throwing out you know we have the water everything we you know we work for as tactile and visual basic inspections that we just can't do autonomously um, yeah no I agree we are we are we are in danger of having engineers that just have look up tables and don't take anything on board. Um, and there's no way of doing artificial intelligence and pattern recognition. It needs people to teach them those things. So it needs good engineers to say what is good and what is bad. So that's you know. So a lot of the time spent is getting the models right and understanding that. And then you would put yourself in that position when you used to go out to see the track under load and go, right? How am I going to detect that with this system? Um, you know, maybe I should have audible inspection. So I actually have a microphone as well. And I know on London Underground, we used to have AVI inspections mm. or visual inspections. You could listen to what the conductor well she was doing and what the, the clink and the clank and all these other noises were doing as well. And that was brilliant. And then they stopped that. And it, but it was a really good source of information because you had the full camera view and the the audio to go with it. And you go, oh, right. Yeah. Because we couldn't do that on tunnels. We couldn't go down and watch a train under the load in the tunnel. Um, so you had to, yeah, yeah. But, but I think. In Hong Kong, where they don't access the track, and lots of high-speed railways where they don't access the track and rely on that, it's probably worth seeing from them what are they missing as well? Because they they've they've been brought up on that technology without actually going onto the track. You know what what are they what do they think they're missing? You know certainly when a derailment occurs, it, that's when I think a lot of things come to the surface to go well. It's because you can't see it under load, or you don't actually know what the track's doing in relation to the train because you may know what the train is doing in relation to the track. <laughs> yeah, but, and just, just one point on that, they'll let everybody else get in with it, but if you've got a high speed railway, yes we can't go out and do manual inspection. The thing is though that most of that was put in all at the same time. Mm. Largely you will get the same degradation throughout the majority of that particular route. Yeah, yeah. So, your inspection trains, which run very regularly on those things, are really looking for the things that do cause you the trouble, which is mostly alignment yeah. problems. You will see the degradation of ballast over a particular period of time, and you will go out and test those at seven or ten year intervals, whatever it might be, which is what they do on mm. those. Now, I accept all that. We have a railway which got Legacy. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, huge yeah. differences in the age of the material, the types of the material, even <laughs> the way that things have to be recognised, you know, and mm. in a, any layout, you can have yeah. many different fastenings and so on, all yeah. different types, this sort of thing. Those are the things that say to me, we have been, we're, we're too soon for taking out the the option of people going and actually looking at what's happening to the track wherever you can and yeah. you can still safely do it Consistent. what seems to have been yeah. done is oh we can't have people on the track so we have to find another way mm -hmm. what you have to what i think you do we need to do that particular thing now let's make it safe for people to do it uh, are you absolutely right you can only apply a lot of that to a consistent track form a consistent yeah. design variability so that's why on S and C plane line pattern, sorry, S and C pattern recognition, they're still coming to terms with that because of the variables. Um, and so when they applied it on Great Western, they had to do a cleansing exercise where they had to make everything look nice and shiny. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to say, this is a perfect piece, yeah, run the train through because it's good. So you're almost baselining it then, aren't you? Yeah. And that, that's, you know, you can't do that with varying different clips and track form types and all these sort of things. And and you're right, there's 
the technology, there's a lot of learning to be done there. And if you if you care if you're not careful, you'll get that wrong. But you're right. And that's you're right. With new modern track forms where it's a consistent like like MTR and Hong Kong and so on, they've got a consistent track form, so they can yeah. do that too. But yeah. Good point, Mark. Phil, I've okay. got two Great. points. Here. So there's a question from someone online called Alex. Uh, he says, is there any consideration of the use of on-train accelerometers to measure dynamic track bed response as a predictor of ballast degradation or voiding? <laughs> yeah, there, there is some work being done with the Track Stiffness Working Group on that, and within TFL they were looking at that as well, how they can generate, because uh, uh, they, they put accelerometers on quite a lot, quite many vehicles. They also do torque acceleration within the motors as well, so they see where, where the motor is struggling to actually gain friction and so on. So, um, but it's not widely understood, I think, as a as a monitoring device or anything like that. So I think more work is need to be done on that. Not part of what I've been looking at, but I know people are doing that uh, and they're looking at um, other ways of of monitoring or, or relay, relaying what the train is doing to what the track bed may be doing as well. But I think with that, you need to validate it. And to validate it, you need to have some measurement systems on the track itself. You know, otherwise, you know, without that, you can't sort of validate the two. You got a question, your own. Uh, I've got yes, one from one from me, not from online. Um, look at the drone survey. As many other people said, fascinating what you can do. Um, things like lipping. If it's viewing just from above, if you get lipping off a crossing nose or something, then of course it's it's going to generate a fake profile. And how do you pick up that that's that's not solid metal, but actually there's a gap underneath it, and it's actually metal yeah. flowing down. Is that in any way possible? Have you got so that what in you, algorithm somehow? What, what you've got is, is it's doing it oblique, 45 oblique, and it's doing straight down. So you've oh, got I see. the it's oblique not, It's view. not just a straight yeah. down camera. The oblique right. view gives you the ortho view. Yeah, if you think of standard. Yeah. So that ortho view. So then as those cross sections, you could see that lipping. And when it's measuring, um, it needs to measure that bit of underneath. And if there's something blocking it, it's going to give you no it'll come out with a, a figure so it will say mm. yes and it'll actually because we looked at this in a certain area where where the gauge didn't look correct and they said that's because there's there's either uh, an irregular head profile there that is causing that problem um, mm. and so you couldn't actually measure it you know similar to you know when we put a gauge on there it's all bridging around it isn't it mm. and measuring it in some cases you can measure in some cases you can't or you have got an actual slope on there on yeah, there. Yeah. so so yeah, so would, would that throw a thought then? And an engineer would look at the picture and go, either that crossing is a weird shape, or oh, that's lipping, because it's going to produce the same picture, but it's not actually the same. You, so you can, and that, that's why we did 3D images. So you can zoom in on the image. So if you think there's a problem there, always mm -hmm. a known lipping. So you can zoom in on the images and then say, uh, and then do a cross section. You can see the lipping on, on there, like with the crossing. Yeah, you had that. But you need to know, uh, I guess. It, no one's trained it to do that yet, so you've got to train it to, to look for that, and you can train it to alert for lipping or alert for side wear and head wear as well. Um, at the moment, it's it's just measuring gauge, and there were areas where we found those irregular spots within the algorithm, <coughs> and they said, oh, there is a slight bit of lipping there that's probably causing it. So, so it does it does pick up, and it's trying to get a view, and it's trying to measure around it from 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 you know the, all of those oblique views as well. Um, so it is able to do that and it, and it will still measure at that sort of crosshair nodal point at that point, uh, even though it, it has to come around it, <laughs> if you know yeah. what I mean. <laughs> so it's still measured from that point because yeah. it's a coordinate and it's that coordinate in, in you know, in, in cloud space. Can you rely on it for side cutting just on a number, Philip? So can you, can you pick up side cutting and, and actually measure the angle for it and how, how far down the head it actually is? Well, you, if you saw those images, Malcolm, there's um, the, the, the accuracy isn't there yet to give us what we you know. We probably measure to 0.5 of a mil with an NR4 gauge, which isn't great. The better there's better systems for measuring that um, uh, and the drone isn't isn't great for that. But it can give you it can give you an outline of a, of a um, side wear or lipping or, you know, or you can see from there, but probably I'd say to two millimetres. So not accurate enough for that at the moment. Um, and that's where we said, well, OK, for an 053 or lipping or NR4, you know, gauge readings, it's better to use a laser on the track um, yeah. to do that. Rodney, you've been trying to get a question in for ages. <laughs> you won't be surprised 
So we here, I share the same views as Malcolm with our 60 <laughs> odd years. I was rather comforted when the first entry on that list of inspections, kicking. Yeah. Well, I've still got my 30 year old VR <laughs> boots <laughs> with a very yeah. warm steel toe cap. Yeah, very exposed. reliable. But one other issue, which Malcolm yeah. didn't mention, I think, was noise. Mm. You can only hear what's happening by being out on site. Now, the interesting thing I have still today is that when some trains go over, well, Tarlis Junction, as I think it's now called, bang, 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 I can hear from my house above the river there. Mm. And I'm thinking, nobody's checking the nose wear. Well, the same problem at Twyford, uh, Twyford West as well, yeah. <laughs> mm. now, one, yeah. one other point. Um, in our day, of course, when you did Paddington, um, all the SNC was managed by, manufactured by Taylor Brothers, was it yeah. not? Yeah. Balfour BT yeah. and then it became well, 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 Progress Rail. Names, but yeah. well, is it still all manufactured by one reliable, reputable company? It's very, very good point, Rodney, because you, that inconsistency in supply, you've got four, Oslo Kodjik Fur Track Work, VAE, Progress Rail, and there's a few others. Balfour BT still have that arm to be able to do certain layouts as well. And and although within the various, I guess their customer base, if you like, we've got different standards and there, there's still variability in, in supply from what we get. And and um, I'd say quality as well, the quality of the inspection. Um, and there, there, there's been a lot of consistency, I think, from the drawing, a lot of the work that Jeff did really, to, to make sure that everything's made the same way, you know, in, in RT and in R60 designs and all of that, all of those. So there's there's been a lot of con consistency and just continuing the REPW. Sort of. But there's still some manufacturers still do things slightly differently, you know, because I guess they they've been able to get away with it and they think it works. And that's mm. that's all that's that's the way we have to do it because of our manufacturing facilities. You know. They do it that way because they think it's cheap. Yeah, and to save money. <laughs> yeah. They're calling it a Hopefully, sorry, Colin. Hopefully, quickly, because I've got to go get the train. Um, I spent 10 years inspecting stuff from manufacturers. Yeah. And we only used string, filler gauges, and templates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But going back to what Malcolm was saying about uh, being out on site. I remember a problem with some switch diamonds up on the Midland region. And what I managed to do was borrow a high speed cine camera from, as it was, Dobby Research. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And mount that in the track in the forefoot. Wow. <laughs> taking a high speed cine film yeah. of traffic going over these switch diamonds. Yeah. And we slowed it down. And we could see exactly what was happening. Yes. Yeah. Under traffic. Yeah. And, and from that, we could work out the solution to yeah. get it right. Brilliant. Yeah. So, um, as I say, that yeah. was ahead of your time, you were. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah that, that's exactly. So, so now with that technology, um, with a GoPro camera, a lot of people are using the GoPro, the small little cameras. They put them down and doing exact same thing that yeah. you were doing there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, Pretty yeah. prehistoric, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah but, and people still, you know, it, it's like lying down in the fourth and then a train going, isn't it? But but no, and, and that's, um, I know certain cameras, we've done a lot of work with cameras where we looked at the wheel well interaction with the camera and we're pointing it where we want the wheel yeah. to be, you know, and yeah. we don't have to validate certain so we want the track to be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now that we've got, and that's what I was saying about Sorry, Rodney's point about the all audible and the, the noise, you know, that's going about the the um, audio inspections we still on, on, on London Underground that soon stop. But it's a great suite used to go into with the four the four screens and the noise going in the background. You used to sit in the AVI suite and listen to it. It's like being in the cab and, you know, and you, you, you've got the, the cab view and you've got the, the four camera views as well. And the cab's similar cameras, but but they're on the train, not on the track. I like the one on the track because then you can see it going up yeah, and down yeah, as well. Yeah, you yeah. know, so you can see what the track's doing because you see, wow, that is moving a lot. And, yeah. you know, um,
one. Yeah, yeah. but link this with general traffic. Yeah. Freight and passenger. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we watch all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. Big wheels, small wheels, all the rest yeah. of it. Yeah. And we were able to sort out what the problem was and how to how to solve yeah. what the solution. Yeah. And you're using that cine footage to mm. do that. Yeah. You know, rewind it and, and just slow yeah, it right pause down. It, yeah, slow it right down. Yeah. 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 And that's what automated sort of inspection is a bit about. It's you know, but you. You you went there, I guess, and said, actually, I need to now have a closer look, and, and you decided that would be a good way of doing it by putting a camera in there. You know? Yeah, well, this, this yeah. was in the days of um, steel tapes, yeah. string, lacquer string. bands, yeah. anything you And the templates as well, because <laughs> you know a lot of people use the templates for checking yeah. the profiles of yeah. switches yeah. and stuff. Yeah. They're still there, but the only the we just rely on the suppliers to do that now. No one, I've never seen anyone going, and get the sets of templates for crossings and switches. You go, dip, 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 dip. I've got a few. Yeah, have you? Probably use the How big was the cine camera? <laughs> oh, crummy. It was quite a meaty thing. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Engage though, yeah. I'm yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Anyway, oh, that's good. Must like that, Colin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have we got any last questions from the room? Sorry. Try and get the last ones in from those at home and uh, those in the room. So, if there's no more questions. Um, Malcolm. Malcolm, could I ask you to do the vote of thanks? Yeah, do we need me to come up there or not? No, no, we'll, we'll come to, to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a roving city camera. We do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. Come a bit closer, Malcolm, if you want. Right. I, uh, I knew this was going to be great pleasure tonight to come and listen to you, Darren. Um, we were not disappointed. Um, technically, I knew that was going to be perfectly fine in any case, but the interest is in it and the practicality as well. And that's where the big difference is, I think, with uh, a few of your contemporaries. The technical <laughs> side is all very good. The practical side is definitely missing. It's not missing as far as you're concerned. I mean, I know that anyway, but it comes over very well as far as tonight is concerned. Um, I was just, just thinking about what Colin was saying there, going back to uh, Taylor Brothers at uh, San Diego. Um, we used to have a resident inspector there, uh, a British Royal inspector there. It was a chap for most of the time that, uh, that I was at, uh, uh, at Derby and at Nottingham, uh, was a chap named David Carter. Um, and he was there all the time um, and knew us very well uh, and all that sort of thing as well. Um, and you could rely on him to do an exceptionally good check on what Taylor Brothers had actually done. Uh, and he would present you with all the, uh, all the data. We would go out and have a look at it as well. Um, but any, all the gauges that you're talking about and so on, he got and he would have them with them and he would actually apply them. And the people at Taylor Brothers would expect him to do that to mm. show the client as well you know? mm. so it was actually very well done in those mm. days there was also another company as well called railway in general at uh, nottingham uh, at what's now called eastfields and they used to make all the ball head layouts and including for yourselves at tfl mm. as well and david used to go to the to there as well to do the inspection and he did it for tfl or mm. the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah at the time so yes, very interesting to go back to those things. Or interesting to hear your uh, your, your comments on about my reservations and, and people like and, and people like Rodney, of course. Some of it is well, we liked the old inspection methods and so on, and it probably would be quite difficult for us to sort of say right, well, we can do all that from in in the office. I think it will actually come to it. It will come to that. But that's what worries me a bit, that we're taking away a lot of that practical knowledge mm. and the feel about a railway. It isn't mm. just a job. It is a feeling about what the track is doing and what trains are doing over it. Uh, and it's it's uh, there's lots and lots of things that make up that particular feeling. And the chances are that you're going to be quite right. I've stood, I've no doubt, and Rodney has as well, and Mike here. We've had problems with, uh, say, um, uh, an embankment slope. 
and I've had a watchman on that side, and he would have said to me, I am a bit concerned about this. I can feel things, and this is just an ordinary trackman, you know, mm. I can feel this. So you go out there and you stand there, a couple of trains passed and this sort of thing, and you get that feeling, this is actually going to go. And mm. what you do is you, well, you're going to stop things before it actually becomes a disaster. I'm not sure there's many people who can do that sort of thing nowadays. Mm. It will happen and they'll say, well, we'll learn a lesson and we'll not move on let it happen again. <laughs> the trick yes, is yes. not how let it happen in the first place. <laughs> anyway, it has been a real pleasure to have you, Darren, tonight. And in your new role as Vice President, mm. we'd like to see you as often as you can manage to come. If you can please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, next meeting, please is uh, our Christmas technical quiz, uh, where we uh, do everything properly. Um, so uh, Colin Brading and David Brace challenging us. Um, everybody wins a prize somehow or other, so make sure you come along. Um, so I've, uh, over the years, started to look forward more and more to the Christmas quiz as a relief from filling my mind with the important stuff and uh, doing the enjoyable stuff, uh, or, well, important is enjoyable too, but uh, that's the next meeting, Christmas quiz, and it will be held not here at Hawker House, it will be held at the Staff Association on Station Hill at Reading, so uh, we'll be able to have a convivial time. Or the Railway Club, as it's more uh, well, okay. usually known. Uh, right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Or Gary. as it is now usually. Yes, what okay. the start time? Um, well, what time do you want? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Six o'clock. There'll be food, of course, and, uh, as well. Well, no, we'll assemble at six, and we'll start the quiz at six thirty. Oh, okay. But um, it'll be six o'clock, six o'clock arrival. Bit of um, discussion, a few beers, and then get on with the quiz. It's seventh um, of December. Seventh of December, Wednesday, the seventh of December. OK, um, all that leaves me to say is thank you very much for a good turnout this evening. Thank you to Darren once again for, for a very me. interesting talk. Um, and thanks for the people who joined us online. Not many left now, most of them have gone, but um, there, was, there was quite a few this evening. So uh, um, thank you very much and we hope to see you for the quiz. Let's have a, a good turnout. Try and drag a few more people along. If you know anybody who's dithering, get on the phone and give them a call and get them to get their asses down to the railway club. Thank you very much. Um, see you next time. Thank you. Right. Darren, you're in talk. Shall I end this? Shall I end this?